Hey, welcome back. This is Mr. Kelly at Kaiserslautern. We're going to talk today about how to go out and collect data when you want to see if there's a relationship between two variables. So maybe like the number of hours you spend on your phone and what your GPA is or your test scores. Those are two variables there and they might be related. And so there's a couple of ways we can go out and collect data on that. It's actually two ways to do it. And one of those ways has a retrospective and a prospective slant to it. So if you learn basically two things, you'll be all right. Let's start with these studies. An observational study is when you go out and collect data. You just go out and you see what the numbers say. And there's two ways to do it. You can do it prospective and retrospectively. Now, retrospectively, think of the word retrospective. That means old. Retro is old. Think of Mr. Sullivan. All the same, old. Okay, so retrospective study is looking at old data that already happened. It's in the past. So we observe what, of our, what has already happened in the past. Maybe we want to look at our AP scores at the school. So we look in the past and we see what has happened in the past. Uh, what the grades are for students who played a sport this year. Okay, do you know, maybe we're trying to see if, you know, playing a sport helps you with your grades, maybe add some structure or something. Or at which times were parents most likely to show up for open house? I could go back a couple years. Maybe you did it at four o'clock and then you do it at seven o'clock. And, you know, you can look at the data to see which one works the best. So the two variables you're looking at, you go back, you look at the data, and you see, is there an association between the two? Are they tied together somehow? That retrospective is looking behind you. Prospective is looking in front of you. So it's in the future. So maybe I want to say, hey, I want to know what's going to happen in seminar these, this next month. Maybe we have a new policy or something. So, you know, I just go out and collect data for seminar. It's coming in the future. I'll write the data down as it happens. And then when it's all done, I'll make some conclusions about it. Or maybe do student grades change before an athletic event? Okay, do students get their grades in so they're not ineligible? May, I don't know. You're gonna, we'll find out. We're going to keep track. Okay, that's prospective because it's in the future. Or maybe, this is probably how many parent complaints will Mr. Bean reply to this year? Because you know he's going to get a whole bunch of these. And so does it reply to them all? I don't know. We'll do a prospective study. We'll find out. So observational studies, they're kind of nice because, you know, they're easy to do. You can just go pull the data and you can correlate it. But you have to be careful because there's a huge difference between these two and then the next one, which is an experiment. So let me show you why real quick. All right, let's, let's go play pretend. And this is real life data. I'm not making this stuff up. If you go to the beach, we'll say Florida or you can say Australia or you can say anywhere really in the world, and you measure the ice cream cones that are sold, all right, so there's my ice cream cone. I'm going to make a little graph right now. It's got like three scoops on there. Pretty nice. And then you go and you measure shark attacks. We just went really, really, that got graphic right there with a shark attack. All right, so would you be surprised if I told you the more ice cream that is sold, the more shark attacks there are? If you go to places that have shark attacks, like I'm from New York, there's no shark attacks. But Florida has them once in a while. And the more ice cream you sell, guess what? The more shark attacks there are. So if you collect that data and you end up with a scatter plot that kind of looks like this, you can make some conclusions like, whoa, the more ice cream that's sold, the more shark attacks there are. Well, we have to be careful. And that's true. That's real. That's real data. But you have to be careful because then people start going, well, yeah, don't be eating ice cream. You be getting eaten by a shark. So we would say that there's a correlation between the two, but not necessarily causation. And that's, kind of, that's something you hear around the stats world. Correlation does not imply causation. It does Just because there's, there's a trend here that we can see, it's true. Yeah, and it's true. doesn't mean that one's causing the other. Like how, maybe the shark attacks cause you to eat ice cream because you're sad. I don't know. The only way to figure it out is an experiment. So experiments... They show cause and effect because what we do is we take all those other... By the way, what happens here? The sun comes out. And when the sun comes out, people go swimming. And they also buy ice cream. And so that sun coming out and the weather being warm causes both of these to happen. So they're not, there, there is an association between the two and there is a pattern that you can graph and you can probably predict. Okay, but it doesn't mean that one causes the other. So experiments are most effective because they show cause and effect, but they're also the most work and they take, you know, they cost money. These are easy up here and we can learn something, but to prove things, you need an experiment. Which medicine is most effective? 
which environmental conditions will create the largest tomatoes or which teaching style has the highest student achievement? All these things, you can only figure that out with experiments. So in an experiment, what we do is we take something and we do something to it. So the something we take, we assign experimental units to treatments, which means these things, we do something to them, whether you know we give them medicine or we put them on exercise regimens or whatever. Those are called treatments. Whatever we do to these experimental units, those are called the treatments. Then we record what happens. And so whatever we measure, that's called the response variable. So, you know, if ice cream uh, sales is our response variable, I would just count how many ice cream sales, if that's what I'm looking to see, or maybe a student's GPA, or the number of students on a DF list. Those are all things that we could record in an experiment, if, if, and we, those are called response variables. It's the thing that you're measuring. If the experiment involves people, then we call the experimental units subjects. So if 50 subjects are in an experiment, that just means 50 people have volunteered. The response variable, as I said, is what we measure in the study or the experiment. All right, so generally it goes like this. We're gonna write this down. Remember, you can pause the video if you need to, but we're gonna take these experimental units. All right, these are these things we're gonna do that experiment to. And we're going to divide them to two treatments. We have treatment one and treatment two. There are two different things going on. Now, treatment two, in this example, I just have it as our control. It's where we have no change. So if we're administering a drug, then treatment one would get the drug. And then, you know, these people down here, they get something that looks like a drug. But we'll talk about that in a second. So after we apply these two treatments, we want to see, you know, hopefully something's changed. We want to be able to compare the results. So we're going to compare the response variables. Remember, response variables are what you're measuring from the treatment. All right, so when we design an experiment, we use randomization and a control group to minimize these lurking variables that I was talking about earlier. So when you take your exper experimental units, you have to, you have to, you have to randomly assign, which means we're gonna use our calculator to each of the um, treatments there. So why do we have to randomly assign, you know, all these experimental units to treatments? Well, because if we do that, we get rid of some of those lurking variables and we add more control. Now, as we said before, the control group is a group in which we apply no treatments whatsoever. That way we can see what happens if no changes are made. So when we deal with medicine, we sometimes give a fake treatment called a placebo, and that would be the control. Okay, a fake treatment called a placebo. If you're given a placebo pill, it's a fake pill. It's just a pill that's just some sugar or something that you, you take and it has no effect. The reason you do this is because a lot of people will get better just because they believe they're receiving a treatment that works. It's called the placebo effect. Like if you go in and you tell someone, oh yeah, this is really going to help you out. A lot of people will believe it and they'll come back and say, you know what, I feel a lot better. Even if it was nothing, if it was just sugar. You could tell that to students. You could say, hey, these are the same problems you did on your homework. So do well on them. And that could cause them to do better on a test or maybe the SAT. Um, that's called the placebo effect. So we want to have a control group. We want to have a treatment, at least one treatment. You could have more. Um, and when you can, you know, set up the control with no, no differences there. To make it the best, you could even not let the people know which one they're getting. Obviously, you don't want people to know if they're getting the drug or if they're getting the control, the placebo. And even better, if the doctor or whoever's giving them this drug or this whatever the treatment is, if they don't even know which one is which, that's the best, and that's called double blind. So there has to be a lot of people involved. Someone's behind a curtain. They say, hey, subject number 42 needs to get this pill, but the doctor that's giving them the pill doesn't know which one it is, and then maybe they come back in a week and they let you know how they're feeling. That would be double blind. So we can have blind experiments and double blind, and that's basically how experiments work. You set up, you take the units, you divide them into groups randomly. You have to randomly assign. Use your calculator. And then once you do that, then you, you, know, you wait or you apply the treatment and see what happens. And then you can compare them later. Okay, so first example. Some people believe that people act crazy. Crazy. You got to be crazy to teach math. Oh, during a full moon. So I thought we were going somewhere else with that. Uh, what would be the best way that you could study this idea? Observational study or experiment? Well, all right, think about it. 
Well, my, and again, pause the video when you need to, to write this down, but my opinion would be it's really difficult to do an experiment here because what you would have to do is you would have to impose a treatment on people. And in this case, it'd be like a full moon. You would have to like impose a full moon on a person. How are you going to do that? You can't control the moon. So for this, you might have to do an observational study. You could do either prospective or retrospective. It'd be difficult to do an experiment because the treatment cannot be controlled. It'd probably be best to do an observational study. You could look at data from police reports, hospital visits, and you could determine if people act crazier on full moon days. Um, so there's our first example. You kind of have to do an observational study there. Okay, so diagram and describe an experiment with 60 subjects. Remember, subjects are people that are in the experiment to determine if medicine A or medicine B is more effective in relieving headaches after watching the Elder Bros, Mr. Brust videos. So if we want to set up an experiment here, we want to create a diagram and we're going to describe it. So we're going to start with the 60 subjects. So let's write that down. And then we're going to assign those 60 subjects to, we have two medicines and we're probably going to want to control. So there's going to be three treatment groups here. So treatment one will be uh, medicine A, treatment two will be medicine B, and treatment three, just a placebo. That's our control group. Now, when we decide who goes where, they have to be randomly assigned. So I'm going to write that down. Random. This is the describe part, by the way. Randomly assigned. By the way, and that goes back to like the last lesson where we do random integer. So I do 1 to 60, and then the first 20 numbers that come up, that would be treatment 1. And the next 20 that come up would be treatment 2, and then the, the remaining ones would be treatment 3. And then when we're all done with this, we're going to take in, what are we, relieving headaches. So then we measure headaches somehow, and then we compare. So we're going to compare headaches. I'm going to say compare headache relief. Hey, there you go. Relief. That's a relief. Okay? So that's how you diagram and describe a uh, an experiment. Ta-da! Now, there are three principles of, an, of experimental design. There are three main things you want to make sure you're doing. Well, th there's a fourth. that You get to that in AP Stats. But right now, there's control. You want to make sure there's a control. So you can compare these two to the placebo. Um that minimizes the lurking variables that we talked about earlier. Randomize. You have to randomly assign subjects to the treatments. And lastly, replicate. Notice it doesn't say we have three people here or we have six people. There's 60. So we're going to replicate this 20 times for each treatment. So that's pretty good. We can then find an average and we can compare them. Okay, so last one is for you. Does drinking coffee before an SAT help raise your scores? I don't know. I don't know. We have 100 people. Diagram and describe an experiment to help you find out. Go. Pause the video and do the last one. Okay, so this is what I came up with. We start with 100 subjects. We get 50 randomly assigned, 50 randomly assigned to treatment one and treatment two. Treatment one, I gave two cups of coffee. Now, as I said, you might have some. Maybe you just wrote coffee. That's fine. But how much coffee are you going to give them? Are you going to give them one cup? Are you going to give them two cups? I want two cups. And then treatment two... I want two cups of hot water because I want to keep everything the same but the coffee. So they get a hot liquid. They get two cups of it. I mean, that keeps it pretty much the same. Now, you could argue maybe you went decaf here. Maybe the caffeine is really what we're looking for. So if you went two cups of deca decaf, then, then your experiment could be double blind. Well, yeah, it could be double blind. It could be a blind experiment. Nobody knows, like, what you got. And then you could do the SAT and see, you know, compare the scores and see how you did. Uh, the way I set mine up, I mean, you, you can't do this blind. People have to drink it. You're not going to put it through an IV. So they're going to know. So I can't do mine blind. But you could do yours blind, maybe. All right? There's one more thing I want to do. Let's go back up to here. We didn't say how many. We, you know, we wanted 20 going here, 20 going here, and 20 going here. I forgot to write those down before. We want to say how many in each one. I'm going to equal number if you can. Here we had 50 and 50. But that's it. Okay? So your homework, it kind of looks... And the rest of the packet, it kind of looks long, but it's not its not really that long. Good luck to you, mate. It's Mr. Kelly and Kaiser Slaughter. Remember, it's nice to be important. More important to be nice. See you.